Trigger warnings for this episode include the discussion of infanticide, non-consensual medical interventions, misogyny, femicide, and murder. Please proceed with caution. In the heart of the Mediterranean is a country like no other. Its language of both Arabic and Latin origin, and its history influenced by their colonization under the British, French, Sicilians, and Spanish, to name a few. Malta is in itself a cultural phenomena. But the thoroughly modern Maltese are carving paths for inclusion and progressivism in impressive ways, excelling in matters of gender and sexuality rights compared to many European countries. So how is it that a country can be both ahead of the curve on transgender and intersex rights, but behind the curve on reproductive freedoms? In this two-parter, we are investigating the tapestry of histories and cultures present in this country, and we are asking the question, who defines and who controls the Maltese body? Welcome to episode 20 of Slash Queer. You're here with me, your host, Georgie Williams. If you were with us back in Season 1, or you've been doing your homework, you might have noticed that Malta is a country whose name has been mentioned before on the Slash Queer podcast. Back in Episode 13, where we investigated the state of intersex rights in the UK, we referenced Malta as one of only five countries in the world who granted intersex individuals, individuals with differences of sexual development, bodily autonomy. Although intersex welfare will not be the central focus of this episode, I will reiterate our original definition of this term. Intersex individuals are individuals born with a hormonal, chromosomal, gonadal or genital variation which is considered outside of the male and female norms. The occurrence rate for this variation is estimated to be 1.7% of the global population. Largely, intersex individuals are treated as second-class citizens and are often victims of non-consensual medical interventions, sterilization, and even infanticide. The other four countries where the right to bodily autonomy is granted to intersex individuals are Albania, Uruguay, India, and Portugal. But whenever I have spoken on this subject in a professional capacity, I have often asked myself, why Malta? How did this small country, a nation which occupies an area of just over 300 square kilometers, end up in this exclusive club of intersex conscious countries? As you will know from our previous episode, my seafaring approach to this project was inspired partly by my desired ship of passage, having already charted a course from France to Malta. As you may also know, serendipity has long been a friend of the Slash Queer project, and it was whilst working still as a deckhand aboard the Yotabori of Sweden from last episode that I made our first important connection to Malta's socio-political climate. Wendy Green was, at the time of us meeting aboard the Yotabori, the US ambassador to Malta. She was the first person who gave me her time on these matters when I arrived in Valletta, and we met whilst I was entertaining high-profile guests aboard ship, in my best historical attire, no less. Wendy was one of the first people to inform me of what I had only heard about from a distance that although Malta seemed to lead the field on a subject as complex as intersex rights, the status of women in Malta was, at best, substandard. Wendy was the first to tell me that if I wanted to understand the culture surrounding gender and sexuality diversity in Malta, I also needed to ask questions about the status of women in this country. As it so happens, I had arrived just in time for an important and tragic anniversary for Malta. 
Daphne Caruana Galizia was a prominent journalist and anti-corruption activist in Malta, who in 2016 and 2017 revealed links between a number of Maltese politicians and the Panama Papers. The Panama Papers were the 11.5 million leaked encrypted confidential documents that exposed a network of over 214 tax havens. Many former and, at the time, present heads of state across Europe were exposed in the process of these papers being leaked, and a great number of prominent political figures were accused of tax evasion and fraud based on the evidence which had emerged. In October 2017, Caruana Galizia was murdered with a car bomb. On the night I met Wendy, just two days shy of the fifth anniversary of this incident, two men were sentenced to 40 years in prison for her murder. I was informed by individuals at the event that these two killers had been closely linked to Chris Cardona, the Maltese government's former minister for economics. Cardona has not been charged for his alleged involvement. Caruana Galizia's sister, Corinne Vela, went on record at an event about women journalists in 2021 to say that a campaign had long existed to dehumanize Caruana Galizia, and that attacks and abuse towards women in this industry had continued even after her death. Prominent Maltese academic Marceline Naudi from the Department of Gender Studies at the University of Malta, has also recently stated in an interview that Maltese culture inherently frames women as being of lesser status in society, and that many cases of femicide in Malta could have been avoided with adequate social and legal responses. Femicide is a term used to describe the killing of women and girls, simply for their status as female. Once I began to learn about these issues in Maltese culture, I became increasingly concerned about what I would and would not find on this leg of the project. I have been introducing myself to locals by, for safety reasons, vaguely describing my work as human rights research. I continue to be told I'm in the right place for it, just not the easy place. To understand the climate around gendered and sexualized bodies in Malta, I knew that I was going to need to talk to someone at the very heart of Maltese healthcare. After all, to understand how the body is treated medically is to understand the politics a state or nation imposes upon it. In the end, I sought counsel with perhaps one of the most significant voices in the push for reproductive and transgender rights in Malta's medical community. I am Chiara Prindabaltzan. I am a gynaecologist by profession. She, her. I am Maltese, but I've done my specialisation in my medical field in the UK for 11 years. And I've returned to Malta now coming up to four years. So, so yes, I'm finding my Maltese roots again. As to what I do, I've worked in the public hospital, in the main hospital that in Malta. And I've worked there within the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, obviously seeing mainly women doing obstetrics, pregnancy, labour ward and gynecology. And more recently, I was then involved in the gender wellbeing clinic. And that was within the public sector. So I was I was a gynecologist, one of the gynecologists in the, in the multidisciplinary team that was taking care of the gender wellbeing clinic. And as part of Willingness team, I also give gynecology services uh, in, within that team. So this is within the private sector. And I also see transgender patients here. And uh, we have a multidisciplinary team that takes care of this in the private practice. Naturally, the first question I had wanted to ask Chiara was based around this increasingly evident disparity between intersex rights and reproductive rights. I wanted to understand why it was that Malta was one of the first countries in the world to recognise the bodily autonomy of people with a difference of sexual development, but was also so far behind on recognising the fundamental rights of women. 
In response to my inquiries, Dr. Frendo Balzan was more than willing to broaden my awareness of what Malta's climate of inequality looked like from an internal perspective. Yes, so this is quite an interesting question. So I I feel like I've got two views. I left Malta in January 2008, returned end of 2019, 2018 actually, 2018. So the Malta I left is not the Malta I returned to. And that goes for everything, for, for commercial stuff, for not just for healthcare, for just being, living in Malta. And over those years, we've had a lot of advancements in gender rights, same-sex marriage. So, and, and Malta, as you're well aware, is in the forefront of all of this. Now, regarding healthcare, female healthcare is very good, but there's, there's some gaps. There's some gaps. Um, Malta is one of those countries where abortion is still illegal. And with this being said, we still don't have free contraceptive services or even subsidised contraception. And there are technically no contraception services in the hospital. So this obviously goes against preventing pregnancies, but then what do we do if we have one that's unwanted? So that's the, with the female health game that I think is almost lacking, right? But as with everything else regarding uh, pregnancy, regarding gynecology, I think we're doing not too bad. I was comparing with the UK where things are driven by nice guidance and there's guidelines on every single topic. Malta's not there with the, with, with the female healthcare. As regards gender healthcare or intersex healthcare or, or for transgender or non-binary, or, something is being done. Something is being done. It's, as you know, it's a new medicine. It's a new specialty. So even us within the medical community, we're still we are discovering things if you if, if you can understand. It's still new. We have trans men who are pregnant, who have got pregnant. This is very few and far between. So there's not a lot that is known about these people who are pregnant or have birthed. So all in all, it's still somewhat new medical specialty. However, when we, even being the gynecologist within the team, we were being trained, we're given training, mainly from, from America, who's, who's leading in all of this. And, uh, and as a gynecologist, there's things I cannot do on my own. We need the endocrinologist. We need the plastic surgeons. There's a whole team. There's the, the psychologist. So there's a whole team. And luckily, we do have a very good clinic that's available within the public health system or the NHS, if you want, okay, where the the, the person doesn't need to pay for the treatment. And there's, well, there's very good support. Now, the limiting factor there is how comfortable is that person going to be attending the clinic? Because still there's there's what is perceived as a taboo. So much so that this clinic is held at separate premises. It cannot be held at the gynae clinic. Although one can never attribute a singular cause behind why a country may deny rights to a particular social group, Many Maltese citizens that I spoke to agreed that the main cause behind Malta's criminalisation of abortion was almost certainly Malta's status as a Catholic country. The story that is told is that 2,000 years ago, St. Paul was shipwrecked on one of the original islands of Malta, and this event led to the spread of Christianity throughout this small country. As of 2019, 95.2% of Maltese citizens describe themselves as Christian, with Catholicism as the main denomination, accounting for 93.9% of the population. 
Although allegedly rarely enforced, Maltese law still stipulates that anyone on the island who undergoes an abortion can be jailed for up to three years, and anyone assisting can be jailed for up to four years. But with a population where Catholicism is so widespread and accepted as the norm, the punishment for undergoing or even assisting in an abortion extends beyond the legal and also likely becomes the social, given how stigmatized the subject remains in this country. Chiara had more to say about how social pressure and judgment surrounding reproductive health services have impacted people, sometimes quite publicly. There was once a little episode, may I just, uh, and this was on over social media, Marta. This person wanted to attend the gynecologist. Uh, she had an appointment and she, the, the, it was during COVID times where there was restrictions and the, the security person was stopping people as they were coming in according to the appointment time, right? Only allowing people in 15 minutes ahead. And this person at the door showed the, the security person the appointment letter. And they were told, since when are men being seen at the gynae clinic? Just because she was masked and presenting as a male. And this blew up over social media because of this ignorance. Ignorance is a non-educated person. Just having that stereotype that gynae is for women. And also, as a gynecologist, I actually don't like saying gynae services. And I say gynae services because I think it's the one that is closest. But I do see men. I do see trans men. And gynae is so associated with the feminine. And I don't have another word for these services. But I see trans men who still have a vagina, who still have a cervix, and they need gynae services. They need a spear test. And these things are done, mistakes are done as well. And But I think it's a learning curve, it's a learning process. Regarding healthcare, it is available. I would like to also take this opportunity using your podcast to encourage men with the vagina, with the cervix, to attend to a gynecologist because, you know, we, we, we're not all bad. <laughs> we're not all bad. And what I've experienced, you know, this is a very close community. And if I do have a client, uh, normally they they encourage their friends to, to attend the gynae because it's important. Naturally, given Chiara's awareness of transgender and also women's healthcare on this island, I wanted to press her on the subject of intersex healthcare. I was conscious here of how her medical education in Wales may be a potential positive or negative influence. But what Chiara had to share made it clear how intersex welfare had not been an exclusively medical issue in Malta. Once, in Maltese history, intersex welfare was a religious issue. Now, in the past, like, a few, a few decades ago, right? Because even when I was in medical school, this was taught to us this way. We were talking about the, these ambiguous genitalia at birth so you cannot assign if it's a female or, or male uh, um, neonate that was born as the whole idea of the medical community was to assign a female because there's no penis even though the there's no labia as such and as there's no penis it's it's easier to give a female life because otherwise it'll be a non-functioning male and I'm sure there was a lot of these these people who felt that internally that they they are male, but they were brought up a tomboy. And this it's interesting that in Malta we had this community of spinsters that would go as Catholicism teachers, so not nuns, but they would remain spinster and wear these dark clothes and all of this. But yeah, if you had to check the chromosomes, probably it would be XY. The doctrina, doctrina was the, the Catholicism classes. But but this was a phenomenon. I remember learning about this. And even when I was doing my specialization and and talking about, you know, what to assign. But in Malta now, we've got this uh, birth certificate where you can actually tick no gender. 
Yeah, which is amazing. And last year there was one that was uh, the parents actually applied not to assign a female or or, or male, which which is quite uh, progressive, isn't it? But in Malta being so Catholic, staunch Catholic, and there's a lot of people who are naive in everything else, where it's wrong, even just being gay, because no, you're not meant to love someone who is like you. You're meant to be a man and a woman because you're meant to procreate. But there's, I think there's been a lot of repressed anger and and if you see, we we only had divorce not too long ago, a few years back. And lots of married couples would live separate, maybe because they were attracted to the other sex. But you were forced to marry someone of the opposite sex. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we've we, we've come a long way, but the view is not. I think it's not yet universal. There's not enough discourse, there's not a lot of discussion out there that makes it normal, if that makes sense. So so we need to be more open and speak about this because there's so much misconceptions, I think. The Catholic classes that Chiara mentions, Dutrina, were oftentimes conducted by these supposed spinsters. Dutrina is a Maltese word for doctrine. And it is, to say the least, highly interesting that the Maltese Catholic Church created social roles for these intersex individuals, where they were tasked with preaching a conservative doctrine. There is substantial literary weight behind Dr. Frendo Balzan's assertion that these individuals may have been considered non-functioning as males if they did not have what was recognised as a penis at birth. In Stephen Kerry's Intersex Men, Masculinities and Disabled Penises, Kerry situates here research within what is described as a phallocentric society, a society which is not only patriarchal in nature, but values above all else the assumed power of the male sexed body. This value, of course, requires scrutiny. Not all individuals of presumed male sex will meet the standards of what is considered a masculine enough body. And naturally, one of the most central sites of this scrutiny is male genitals. Kerry writes that many men who are intersex often have to navigate pluralized masculinities, sometimes because their genitalia is considered inadequate, both pre- and post-surgical intervention. It seems reasonable to state that under a patriarchal institution such as the Catholic Church, there would have been no choice for an intersex person with a supposedly inadequate penis to live as a man. We should, therefore, resist any inclination we have to describe this involvement of intersex individuals in the Catholic Church as inclusion or acceptance. In 2015, the Maltese government passed the Gender Identity, Gender Expression and Sex Characteristics Act, which protects particular rights for transgender and intersex individuals. However, the Equality for Men and Women Act was also passed in 2003, which stipulates that the treatment of a person in a less favourable manner than another person constitutes discrimination. But, evidently, Restriction to essential medical services such as abortion is not considered less favourable treatment. Although on paper, particular protections exist for women and transgender and intersex multi-citizens, there is only so much that these legislations can ensure when it comes to reasonable reproductive health care. Furthermore, there is only so much this legislation can do to influence wider social opinions on the value of women transgender individuals, and intersex individuals in Maltese culture, as Chiara made evident to me. It's, it's quite interesting, because I've only been Malta for four years, so I'm seeing some aspects of things, even through my, my, my own social circle. As regards to rights and legal rights, or what, you know, what you're entitled to, Legally, we have a lot 
to improve. It, it's super interesting. Super interesting. Because as we just talking, like through my head, I'm I'm seeing flashes of how women are not treated properly in Malta. Case in point, tax. If you get a tax back on something, it goes to your husband. So you're going through a separation. Good luck with that. Who's going to him? I know. Even I was shocked. I'm not married. Obviously, this has, this has, has not affected me. But when I'm hearing, I'm like, what? Is this real? Is it? Yes. And you can't go to a bank and say anything because it's it's for both of you. And he re- he would receive the tax back. So, so yeah, there we go. <laughs> It's very interesting. I, th- I think we are, I, I don't know, speculation, as, as you said, but it's quite popular. You know, it's the modern things to accept, to accept sexuality in, in, in its all various forms. And and even having your, your surname, there was a bit of a of a kerfuffle with, with having your surnames. And uh, when you, when, so when you get married in the Maltese culture, you normally take your, your husband's surname, right? And obviously with same-sex marriages. Now, what happens? And a question that is often asked is, so who's the man? <laughs> yeah, they're both men. Like, so, but one of them needs to be the man, no? And it's like, I, when I hear it, I cringe. I cringe because it's like, but, but how do you ask such a question? They all, you see, this goes to, we need to talk more about this. But, but yes, going back to the surnames, so... Then you could choose to either combine the two or choose either or, but there needs to be a family name. So then this moved on to even hetero couples getting married. So now you can take either his surname, you can take her surname. So, so far I've not seen a couple who has taken his surname, but they can join surnames. And it's a big thing for a man to take the woman's surname. How random is that, right? So, yes, so these are a few things. I don't know if you're uncovering a few things, speaking to people in Malta. I feel like we are trying to change things to be the popular party in politics, maybe. Because if you say something that is not accepted, then you don't get the vote. And there's a lot of things like that in Malta. So a lot of politics is for votes, right? And I'm sure there's lots of countries that are like that. But yes, I, I think that, listen, we're doing this because it's popular. No, we need to do this because it's that person's rights. And that person could be intersex, could be female, and we should have equal rights. We need to be diverse and equal. In my job as an obstetrician, seeing pregnant women who, if, if I get this couple who ask me, can you please tell us the gender and we have to have this gender reveal and tell us if it's a boy or a girl. And I jokingly do tell them, oh, let's see if it's still a girl because, you know, what do you mean still a girl? No. And I have had couples tell me, uh, if he wants to change, I'll kick him out. Huh? I'm like, okay. Wow. Wow. Do you know what I mean? So there's still that almost unacceptance, but, or maybe, maybe naivety right but i i kind of make a joke out of it because obviously it's not happening it's not serious but but i i believe i personally believe that in five years time couples won't be asking me for gender i think that's the way malta's heading probably not in the uk when i was working in the uk probably not not there yet i think the uk is quite like strict we like as we are (laughs) we don't want anything out of like anything external no Mm. Um, but but yes, I genuinely believe that in a few years' time we're going to be more open to allowing kids to see what they feel like, and maybe that's fluid. No, but I think things are things are moving, things are changing. In the last four years, I've seen I've seen improvement in even being comfortable in your own skin, going outside, going to a posh restaurant, and actually wearing whatever you want to wear if you're queer and you want to show who you are to the world do it do it and you know what when i see this i'm like yeah that's good (laughs) put your ear in Uh, well done you you know and this was all hidden in the past see this was all hidden 
And it's it's sad to think because this is not something new. This is not something you, how you feel within yourself. It's not something of this times. It's always been centuries. And to feel, to think that it was so hidden, someone must have suffered so much internally, going through conversion therapy, just to be someone who they're not. So yeah, I think I think there's improvement. It's it's improving. It's improving. Come back in five years' time and we'll see. <laughs> I was inspired by the optimism Chiara held for the direction of gender consciousness in Malta. The belief she had that parents may, sooner rather than later, become less interested in placing often rigid sex-based expectations upon their children. Nevertheless, Dr. Frendo Balzan also gave me significant insight into the influence of the Catholic Church on both the politics and cultures of this community. The regulation of what the body could look like seemed more progressive here than in other countries, based on their protection of intersex bodily autonomy. But what the body could do, or should be used for, was evidently a more taboo subject. It is worth noting that many intersex individuals are sterilized in the process of the non-consensual surgeries that are forced upon them as babies in most countries. Chara noted the importance of procreation under Catholicism, an argument often used with homophobic intent. So was the protection of intersex bodily autonomy somehow connected to the criminalization of abortion? Were these values somehow grounded in preserving the idealized natural body at all costs? These were points of speculation, and they demanded we further our research in Malta. My interview with Chara couldn't possibly be our final interview in Malta. To understand the complexities of the climate around gender, sex, sexuality, the body, and the power of religion in this country, we had to bring in more voices. To do this story justice, we needed to expand the arena. And in our next episode, I will be bringing these voices to you, from people who know the culture of identity politics in Malta, both personally and professionally. Join us next time for part two, where we will learn more about what differentiates Malta from the currents of change in Europe, and how it is that this small and unique country has developed into a socio-cultural anomaly. Our investigations into what makes the Maltese body continue. This episode of the Slash Queer podcast was edited by Sam Clay, transcribed by Bronya Smith, scripted, produced, and hosted, as always, by me, Georgie Williams. A very special thanks to Dr. Chiara Frendo Balzan for her insightful contributions to this episode, as well as former US Ambassador to Malta, Wendy Green, for her time and wisdom. I want to take a moment here to make a call for support. As you'll know by now, I'm back on the road for research, and whilst our team is working away at bringing these episodes to you back home, I'm doing a lot of time travelling to interview locations and eating mediocre instant packets of oatmeal between research engagements. We love doing what we do here at Slash Queer, which is bringing you education and resources on a sensitive subject to your ears for free. But running this project is very costly. Having recently done the maths, we found out that if all of our subscribers donated one US dollar a month to this project, Slash Queer could run full time without requiring personal funding from the pockets of our team members. One US dollar a month could absolutely change our lives and make this project feasible in the long term. If you haven't considered it before, Maybe you'd like to support us with your one US dollar? You can find our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash slash queer. That's S-L-A-S-H queer. The link is in the description for this episode. It is that easy to donate and support us. And know that with every contribution you make, I am personally battling the desire to kiss you on the forehead out of gratitude for helping us do what we do best. 
You can find our slash queer merchandise on Threadless, and we are still accepting donations via coffee. The links to both are in the description for this episode. This episode was recorded on location in Valletta, Malta. Music in this episode was composed by our resident audio king, Sam Clay. If you enjoyed this episode or have any feedback, please get in touch on Instagram or Twitter at at slash queer, or email us at slash queer at outlook.com. As our quest continues, stay kind.